नमस्कार दोस्तों मैं शिवानंद उपाध्याय आपका स्वागत करता हूं हमारे यूट्यूब चैनल केमिस्ट्री एकेडमी फॉर आई टी जेई एंड नीट दिस इज देंथ डे ऑफ जेई मेन्स रिविजन टूडे वी आर गोइंग टू डिस्कस अबाउट केमिकल इक्लिब्रियम आई वॉज गोइंग थ्रू द पेपर लास्ट ईयर पेपर and i found that most of the questions in equilibrium chapter is asked from solubility and solubility product so few important topics regarding chemical equilibrium yadi aap हमारे चैनल पे नए हैं तो प्लीज अगर आपने चैनल को सब्सक्राइब नहीं किया है तो इसको सब्सक्राइब कीजिए वीडियो देखने के बाद अगर आपको पसंद आता है तो इसको लाइक जरूर कीजिए तो आइए शुरू करते हैं केमिकल इक्विलिब्रियम सो केमिकल इक्विलिब्रियम में सबसे पहले हम शुरू करेंगे फिजिकल इक्विलिब्रियम से सो फिजिकल इक्विलिब्रियम मीन्स देर इज नो चेंज इन द फॉर्मूला on the left hand side and right hand side so when we are discussing about this physical equilibrium the first is melting so what is the definition of melting point when we are discussing melting point melting point is the condition of temperature and pressure it is the condition of temperature and pressure at which solid and liquid form of a substance are in equilibrium if the substance is volatile then vapor pressure of the solid substance is equal to the vapor pressure of the liquid is substance right so we have discussed this in liquid solution when we are discussing about melting melting and freezing is same if the substance is volatile the vapor pressure of the solid form of the substance is equal to the vapor pressure of the liquid form of the substance when we discuss thermodynamics in thermodynamics we are going to derive this equation that change in gibbs free energy of a pure substance is equal to v into dp minus s into dt this is variation of gibbs free energy of pure substance with temperature and pressure but in chemical equilibrium or physical equilibrium we are discussing about phase transition so during phase transition we are discussing about a process in place of g that should be delta g of the process so if here we are discussing about equilibrium in place of g it should be delta g of the process in place of v it should be delta v of the process in place of s it should be entropy change during the process so variation of change in gibbs free energy of the process with pressure and temperature d of delta g is equal to delta v into dp minus delta s into dt so this is very important in physical equilibrium or phase transition when solid and liquid form of a substance are in equilibrium at equilibrium delta g is equal to 0 so in this equation if delta g is equal to 0 g Uh, differentiation of uh, a constant will be zero so left hand side will be zero from the right hand side we can write that delta v into dp is equal to delta s into dt and from here we can write that variation of pressure upon variation of temperature is equal to entropy change during the process divided by volume change during the process so this is pressure versus temperature graph for phase transition this is variation of pressure that is change in y upon change in x so it is the tangent at a point on the curve pressure versus temperature curve so this tangent will depend on change in entropy upon change in volume since phase transition is taking place for phase transition delta g is, is equal to 0 we can use this equation this equation is valid at constant temperature delta g is equal to delta h minus t delta s at equilibrium delta g is equal to 0 so from there we can write that delta s is equal to delta h upon t or we can understand that during the phase transition temperature pressure is constant so when we are writing entropy change entropy change is equal to dq reversible upon temperature when pressure is constant this dqp reversible is equal to dh so dh upon t and if we integrate since temperature is constant from there we can write that delta s is equal to delta h upon temperature so both way we can derive this equation now here if i am putting the value of what is entropy change during melting that is equal to delta h fusion divided by temperature divided by volume change in the process so volume change can be positive or it can be negative for this we are going to discuss example in which case volume change will be positive and in which case volume change will be negative but delta h fusion is always positive melting is always an endothermic process so from here if we are discussing about water for water we know that the density in liquid state is greater than the density in solid state when we are discussing about melting means solid is converted into liquid state in case of water the 
volume of solid form of water is greater than the volume of liquid form of water. So volume change means volume of liquid minus volume of solid. So delta V will be negative in case of water when the density of liquid form is greater than density of solid form. So if I, we are drawing this pressure versus temperature graph for water, this graph has negative slope and this negative slope dp upon dt is because of change in volume because delta h and temperature in kelvin is always positive because of this volume change is negative this slope is negative so now if we discuss that for melting of ice what are the favorable condition so for melting of any substance if we are discussing favorable condition for melting of substance First thing we have to discuss that which type of substance it is. If the substance is like ice where the density of liquid form is greater than the density of solid form when the substance is like ice water system where the density of water is greater than the density of ice then we can see from the graph. It's obvious from the graph. Mathematically we can see here that on this pressure versus temperature graph, if I am keeping the temperature same, keeping the temperature same, and if I am increasing pressure, if I increase the pressure, then solid will convert into liquid. So we can say that for melting, I have to go in liquid state. So on keeping the temperature same and increasing the pressure, high pressure is required to convert this solid into liquid state. So high pressure is favorable condition. Same way we can say here that keeping the pressure same, and changing the temperature, we, we can increase the temperature on increasing the temperature, we are moving from solid state to liquid state. So we can say from this pressure versus temperature graph that for a favorable condition for melting of ice is high temperature and high pressure. And if we don't know the graph, we should uh, learn a more easy thing. We have to see that the process is endothermic or exothermic. If the process is endothermic, then on increasing temperature, the process will move in forward direction. And we have to see that if we increase pressure on anything, then the system, because on applying pressure, the mass is not going to change. Density is mass upon volume. If we increase the pressure, volume will decrease, means the system will move in that direction where the density is increasing. So always it is valid when we are increasing pressure, system will move in that direction where density is increasing. Density of liquid state of water is greater than density of solid state. That's why on increasing pressure, solid will convert into liquid on increasing temperature. Uh, that on increasing temperature, we can say here that solid is converted into liquid because the process is endothermic. So we can say that if process is endothermic on increasing temperature reaction will move in forward direction on increasing pressure the system will move in that direction where the volume of the system is going to decrease or density of the system is going to increase. For most of the substance the density in solid state is greater than the density in its liquid state. Most of the substances if I'm saying iron the density in solid is greater than density of li in liquid state. If I am saying carbon dioxide, so for carbon dioxide also, the density in solid state is greater than density in liquid state. There are few uh, exceptions where it is not valued. Like according to our syllabus, if we are discussing whatever given in NCRT, there are four substances that is water, gallium, arsenic, and antimony. For water, gallium, arsenic, and antimony, the density in liquid state is greater than density in solid state. But for other substances, density of solid state is greater than density of liquid state. So we are discussing this pressure versus temperature graph. In gaseous state, we have discussed that carbon dioxide is the first gas which was liquefied in lab. And we are using carbon dioxide as dry ice. So we should understand that what is the favorable condition for melting of the substances where the density in solid state is greater than density in liquid state. So again, from this graph, we are interested in this portion of the graph. Same way we are writing that dp upon dt. dp upon dt is equal to delta h upon t divided by volume change since volume change is positive when the density of solid state is greater than liquid state on melting volume of liquid is greater than volume of solid so delta v will be positive delta h 
melting is always positive temperature in kelvin is always positive so this slope is positive that's why this is straight line here we are discussing this for carbon dioxide or for substances in which the density in solid state is greater than density in liquid state here also we can find out that if we are keeping the pressure same and increasing the temperature so on increasing temperature solid will convert into liquid or we can say that melting is an endothermic process so on increasing temperature, the re reaction will move in forward direction when solid is converted into liquid. We have to comment about pressure. Then also we can keep the temperature constant. So on increasing pressure, we can see here that liquid will convert into solid. So on decreasing pressure, solid will convert into liquid. So favorable condition is high temperature and low pressure because on decreasing the pressure solid will convert into liquid state or we can see normally without this graph also we can say that melting is an endothermic process so on increasing temperature reaction will move in forward direction and the density of solid state is greater than density of liquid state then we can say that on decreasing the pressure, the substance will move in that direction where volume is more. So volume is more in liquid state. So both way we can find out that what is the favorable condition. So in general, we can say that for melting temperature is always high, but pressure will depend on the type of substance. If the substance is such that the density in liquid state is greater than density in solid state, then high pressure is required and if the substance is such that the density in solid state is greater than density in liquid state then low pressure is required same way we can discuss that what is the favorable condition for boiling for all the liquids if we draw pressure versus temperature graph it is the curve like this on the left hand side there is liquid state and on the right hand side there is vapor state because at high temperature vapor state will be there at high pressure liquid state will be there so this is for all liquid there is no exception in that and from here you can find out both ways we know that if we don't know this graph also we can say that when we are converting some liquid into gaseous state conversion of liquid to gas is always an endothermic process if it is an endothermic process high temperature is required high temperature will be the favorable condition for this high temperature is favorable condition for this so we can say here that high temperature will be favorable condition when we are discussing about pressure we know that if we increase pressure substance will move in that direction where density is more so we want to move in gaseous state where density is less. So we can say that low pressure. So high temperature and low pressure is favorable condition for boiling of any liquid. High temperature or low pressure. If we know the graph from the graph also we can predict. If we want to comment about temperature, keep the pressure same and increase the temperature. On increasing the temperature, we are moving from liquid to vapor state or keeping the temperature same. And if we are changing the pressure, we have to move from liquid to vapor. So we have to come in downward direction. So liquid to vapor, low pressure, liquid to vapor, low pressure and high temperature. So these are the conditions for boiling of a liquid. The third condition is favorable condition for sublimation. Sublimation means we are discussing about conversion of solid directly into gas. So for any solid and gas, if we draw pressure versus temperature graph, it is like this. It is a curve on in high temperature gaseous state will be there. At high pressure, solid state will be there. If we don't know the graph, then also we can say that we are converting H2O solid into H2O gas, right? So it is an endothermic process. Any solid to gas sublimation is always endothermic. So if it is endothermic, we can say that high temperature is the favorable condition and if we want to discuss about the pressure we know that if we increase the pressure the system will go in backward direction because density of solid is more than density of gas so we can say low pressure will be the favorable condition to convert a solid into gas so high temperature and low pressure if we know the graph pressure versus temperature graph solid to gas so we if we want to comment on temperature keep the pressure same and on increasing temperature, we are moving from solid to gas. If we want to comment about pressure, keep the temperature same and change the pressure. 
so if we have to move from solid to gas we have to come downward direction solid to gas so we'll say that lower the pressure and increase the temperature is the favorable condition for converting a solid into gas and when we are discussing about this uh, vaporization means boiling and sublimation what is the difference because with nature of both the graphs will be same but when we discuss variation of equilibrium constant with temperature we write that ln k equilibrium 2 upon k equilibrium 1 is equal to delta h of the process upon r t2 minus t1 upon t1 t2 for both these we can write this formula ln k equilibrium 2 upon k equilibrium 1 is equal to delta h of the process upon r t2 minus t1 upon t1 t2 so here when we are talking about boiling delta h of the process is delta h vaporization when we are discussing about sublimation this is delta h sublimation and we know that delta h sublimation is always greater than delta h vaporization so when we discuss about the steepness of the curve that on increasing temperature the pressure increase will be more in sublimation so this is a steep graph with respect to boiling boiling is little bit slow graph on increasing temperature the increase in pressure is relatively less while in case of sublimation or increasing temperature increase in pressure vapor pressure will be more it is more steep and it is less steep so that is the difference between boiling and sublimation same way we can discuss about conversion of graphite to diamond this is very common in j mains and advanced graphite conversion to diamond so if we know some things some uh, points regarding graphite and diamond so when we are going to study carbon family then also we know about graphite and diamond some properties of graphite and some properties of diamond like the density of diamond is greater than density of graphite density of graphite this is the first point and conversion of graphite to diamond is an endothermic process in thermochemistry we are going to discuss that we can write that delta h of this reaction is equal to delta h combustion delta h combustion of reactant that is graphite minus delta h combustion of product that is diamond and diamond is thermodynamically unstable if a substance is unstable then its heat of combustion will be more so this is unstable and this is relatively stable thermodynamically stable so heat of combustion of graphite is less if i am saying this value is minus 10 then this value will be minus 12 so if we simplify this this value will be positive so conversion of graphite to diamond is an endothermic process so that we know from thermochemistry and the second part is from p block we know that density of diamond is greater than density of graphite so from here without knowing the graph of graphite and diamond pressure temperature graph by using this endo and density we can find out that which is favorable condition for endothermic reaction we know that for endothermic reaction high temperature is favorable condition on increasing temperature reaction will move in forward direction so high temperature will be favorable condition and if we increase the pressure the system will move in that direction where density is increasing the density of diamond is more than graphite so we can say that high temperature and high pressure is the favorable condition for converting graphite into diamond very common question if with this information we can answer it so these are some examples of physical equilibrium now we are going to discuss chemical equilibrium we are not going to discuss all about the chemical equilibrium by going through past year questions whatever questions they are asking we are discussing that only and since equilibrium is one chapter so when the question will come mainly it will come from ionic equilibrium in ionic equilibrium also 90 percent come questions will come from solubility and solubility product so keeping that in mind we are discussing this chapter so relation between kp and kc so many times they are asking this question in je mains relation between kp and kc all of us know that kp is equal to kc rt to the power delta ng so now when they will ask when they will give kc they can ask kp and vice versa so while putting the formula we should know that if pressure is given in atm the unit of kp will be the unit of pressure unit of pressure usually atm right and k 
kc means concentration term so concentration term if the value of kc is in mole per liter units of moles per liter then the value of r we know that pv is equal to nrt pressure is in atm volume is in liter moles then the value of r is 0 0.0821 so when you are calculating this relation what r you have to take like if the value of kp is given in pascals right SI unit Newton per meter square, some power of Pascal depending upon the type of reaction. So if it is in SI unit and the value of concentration is given in mole per meter cube, mole per meter cube, then the value of R is equal to 8.314. So while applying this formula, be careful about that. 95% we are going to use R is equal to 0 0.0821 because KP we are writing in terms of ATM, KC we are writing in terms of mole per liter. So the value of RT is equal to 1. When we put R is equal to 0 0.0821 and calculate the temperature, that temperature at which R into T is 1 is 12.18 Kelvin. It's a very low temperature because if we want to calculate in degree Celsius, what you have to do? that 12.18 minus 273.15. So from there, you'll get that this is a very small negative value and we'll never do experiment at that minus 200 degrees Celsius temperature. So most of the time, if we are doing experiment near about room temperature, that's why for most of the experiment is carried about above 12.18. Therefore, the value of R into T for us is always greater than 1. So when we are writing Kp and Kc, which is greater, keeping in mind that RT is greater than 1, we are answering. So if RT is greater than 1, means temperature is greater than 12.18 Kelvin, then we can say that if delta Ng is positive, then Kp is greater than Kc. Delta Ng is 0, then Kp and Kc is equal. And delta Ng is negative, then Kp is less than Kc. So these type of questions, I have seen 4 or 5 questions based on this in past J mains paper. So be careful about the relation between Kp and Kc. Now, this is also very important. This is not only important for J mains. This is also important for J advanced. So when we are discussing about relation between equilibrium constant and delta G naught reaction because we are using this equation delta G reaction is equal to delta G naught reaction plus RT ln reaction quotient and from there we are saying that at equilibrium delta G is equal to zero when delta G is equal to zero the reaction quotient is equal to equilibrium constant and from there we are writing that delta G naught of the reaction is equal to minus RT ln equilibrium constant. So this is very common. Everybody know that delta G naught is minus RT ln equilibrium constant. Now we know that equilibrium constant can be represented in two form. In simplified form, we are saying Kp and Kc, but basically they are Kp naught and Kc naught. So for simplification, we are writing Kp and Kc. First, our point of discussion is when to use Kp and when to use Kc. Like first we are taking an example like this is the reaction. For this reaction, we can write a relation between Kp and Kc. Kp is equal to Kc RT to the power delta Ng. Delta Ng is 1. Now if Kc of this reaction is given and they are asking about delta G naught of the reaction, we cannot use Kc. Why we cannot use Kc? We have to understand that. If the, for a pure substance, in solid, liquid and gaseous state, the standard state means pressure should be 1 bar. According to new convention, pressure is 1 bar. 20, 25 years ago, we are taking 1 atm. So still in many questions, we are using 1 atm, right? But now the standard pressure is 1 bar. So here for this reaction, PCl5 is a gas. So for when we are writing this delta G0, what is the meaning of delta G0? First, we have to understand. So delta G0 means what? Delta G0 means G0 of product minus G0 of reactant. What is G0 of product? G0 of product means for this reaction, there are two products, PCl3 and Cl2. So these products are present in unmixed pure state at one bar pressure in stoichiometric moles, right? So if I am saying here that this reaction delta G0 means what? Delta G0 means G0 of product. G0 of product means unmixed product. 
means one mole of PCl5 gas at one bar and the temperature at which the reaction is taking place. Suppose this reaction is taking place at T temperature. So one mole of PCl3 at one bar and T temperature and one mole of Cl2 at one bar and T temperature and they are unmixed. So we'll say that PCl3 is in a standard state, Cl2 is in a standard state. And when we are talking about G0 of the reactant means one mole of PCl5 is at one bar and T temperature. Since these are gases, for gases a standard state means it should be present at one bar. So when we are discussing, it is theoretical type of thing, right? When the reaction will take place in a container, we cannot say that the pressure of the whole system is equal to one bar. If it is one bar, then pressure of PCL3, CL2 and PCL5 is not equal to one bar. So it is theoretical type of thing. And delta G0 of the reaction means the slope of this because extent of reaction from zero to one. So the denominator is one. Extent of reaction difference will be one. And G0 of product minus G0 of the reactant means slope of this line is representing delta G0 of the reaction. It is a theoretical thing. So for delta G0 of the reaction, when we are writing equilibrium constant, if gas is there in the chemical reaction, standard state of gas is pressure. So we will use Kp. We cannot use Kc. We will not use Kc for the reaction in which gaseous substances are there. So for this reaction, we have to use Kp. Delta G0 is minus RT ln Kp. We cannot use Kc. Okay. So sometimes in the question, they will give Kc and they will write delta G0. First, you have to calculate Kp and then put in this equation to get the value of delta G0. Taking another example, calcium carbonate in solid state is dissociating to form calcium oxide in solid state plus carbon dioxide in gaseous state. For this reaction also, we know the relation. So again here, pure solid, pure solid and pure gas. When we are discussing about Kp, then delta G0, then we have to take this as pure unmixed form at one bar pressure. So we have to use Kp. So for this also, this is correct. If we write delta G0, they have given Kc. And if we are writing, we know that Kp is equal to Kc. They have given Kc from there, we can calculate Kp. So we will put Kp in order to calculate delta G0. If we are writing directly Kc, it is wrong. So very important point they can ask in J mains as well as advanced. You should be very careful about this. This is wrong. You cannot put Kc for calculating delta G0 of the reaction. Yes, if this reaction is all the reactants and products are in aqueous state. So here, if we discuss this ester is in impure form. This is in impure form. This is not pure form of a substance. So if the substance is there in impure form in solution, it's standard state means its concentration should be one mole per liter. So the standard state of ester means its concentration is one mole per liter or acid means concentration is one mole per liter or alcohol concentration is one mole per liter. So in this particular case, if I have to calculate delta G0 of reaction, there is no meaning of Kp of the reaction. So delta G0 of the reaction is minus RT ln Kc. So I think you are now aware that when to use Kp and when to use Kc to calculate the value of delta G0, right? And when we study thermodynamics, because many there are many questions based on that. So we are writing delta G0 is equal to minus 2.303 RT log equilibrium constant. Now you understand that which type of equilibrium constant to be used when. But at 298 Kelvin, you should know the value of 2.303 RT because in exam you don't have time. So when thermodynamics will come, this is given in NCRT directly. They have given the data at 298.15 Kelvin. We'll discuss this point because these type of things are coming again and again in questions. Right. Now the third next point is relation between mole fraction P total and Kp. This is a very simple thing, but many questions in JE mains is based on this concept. So what they will give initially, they will give that at time t is equal to zero. This is the equilibrium reaction and initially PCL5 is there. Sometimes in question, they will not say who is present initially. They will say dissociation of PCL5 and you have to solve the problem. So it's a common sense if nothing is mentioned, we'll start only with pure form of PCL5. Some moles will be there and they are dissociating. So 
a moles of PCL5 is dissociating. So at equilibrium A minus X, X and X. For this reaction, if I am writing what is Kp, Kp of the reaction is partial pressure of PCL3, partial pressure of Cl2 upon partial pressure of PCL5. Partial pressure is mole fraction into total pressure, mole fraction into total pressure, mole fraction into total pressure. One total pressure will cancel out. So if we further simplify, Number of moles of PCL3 upon total number of moles. Number of moles of Cl2 upon total number of moles. Number of moles of PCL5 upon total. One total number of moles will cancel out. So this is the final relation. Kp is equal to number of moles of PCL3, number of moles of Cl2, number of moles of PCL5, total number of moles and P total. P total will be given. Moles will be given. You can calculate Kp or all the variables are given except one with the help of that you can calculate that variable so many question based on this concept partial pressure concept right so these are very simple you we can apply this formula and there is a common sense if nothing is mentioned about that what is the initial will proceed by this method we are assuming that initial amount of pcl5 is a and then we are moving in this direction Relation between degree of dissociation, P total and Kp. Suppose we are taking one example where the change in number of moles on dissociation is positive. Delta Ng is positive. PCL5 in gaseous state is decomposed to give PCL3 in gaseous state plus, plus Cl2 in gaseous state. Initially, only PCL5 is there. So the number of moles we have taken A. When we are writing in terms of degree of dissociation, be careful about the definition when we are defining degree of dissociation it means that it is the number of moles dissociated upon initial number of moles here we have taken initial number of moles is equal to a so number of moles dissociated is equal to a alpha so what is the number of moles left initial moles was a now a alpha is dissociated so the number of moles left is a minus a alpha and on this balance reaction, when one particle of this will dissociate, one particle of this will form. So if A alpha particle of this will dissociate, A alpha particle of PCL5 will form, A alpha particle of Cl2 will form. So Kp for the reaction, we can write partial pressure of PCL3, partial pressure of Cl2, partial pressure of PCL5. And if we put the value in terms of number of moles, we are getting that Kp is number of moles of PCL3, number of moles of Cl2, Number of moles of PCL5, total number of moles P total. Here, if I put the value of number of moles, we write that number of moles of PCL3 is A alpha and Cl2 is A alpha. So in numerator, A alpha square into P total because one P total will cancel out. Here it is number of moles of PCL5 that is A1 minus alpha. Total number of moles on adding these three is A1 plus alpha. So A and A in numerator and denominator is cancel out. So the important point is whenever we have to write the relation between alpha P total and Kp, it is independent of initial moles. Either you take A mole or you take one mole. The answer is not going to change. So this is the important conclusion. The relation between alpha Kp and P total is independent of moles of chemical species dissociating. So we are going to use this again and again. For example, suppose here two moles of ammonia in gaseous state is dissociating to form nitrogen in gaseous state plus three times of hydrogen in gaseous state. And I have to write the relation between Kp, alpha and P total, right? So for this relation, I can take A or 1. It is not going to change. So for saving time, we can assume that initial moles of NS3 is 1. So we can write 1 minus 2 alpha. Many of the students, because we have an habit of writing extent of reaction that if initial A moles of this is there, A minus 2x, then x and 3x. But when we are writing 2 alpha, we are not aware that we have assumed that 2 alpha is the degree of dissociation. 2 alpha is equal to number of moles dissociated upon initial number of moles. Initial is 1. So dissociated is 2 alpha. So you have taken the degree of dissociation as 2 alpha. But in your mind, alpha is the degree of dissociation. So when you are writing, don't write in this form. This is totally wrong because in your mind, alpha is degree of dissociation. Whatever the coefficient here, you always write 1 because you follow the definition that alpha is equal to alpha is equal to number of moles dissociated upon initial number of moles. So moles dissociated is alpha. So from here, we know that if two particles will dissociate, one particle will form. So if one particle will dissociate, half particle will form. 
So that's why when we are writing one minus alpha, here will be alpha by two and here three alpha by two. This is the right way. And this is a very common error done by you people, right? So be careful about that. Never write the coefficient. It is extent of reaction, then it is fine. But never use in terms of degree of dissociation. Always write like this, follow this, okay? So from here, we can derive the relation between degree of dissociation, average molar mass and theoretical molar mass. So I'm not deriving, I'm directly using this relation that degree of dissociation is M theoretical minus M experimental upon M experimental N minus one. This is very simple, we can derive, right? So I'm using this formula direct. And in this formula, when I'm writing theoretical means whatever the molecular formula is telling, like here, in this reaction, sulfur trioxide is dissociating. So theoretical molar mass means molar mass of formula of SO3, that is 80. So theoretical mass means 80. Now experimental mass is given because if we do experiment, then we can calculate what is experimental molar mass. So it will be given in the uh, question. And N is what that is important. So N is very important. N is the number of particles formed by dissociation of one particle. Like for it, this reaction, when two particles of SO3 will dissociate, two particle of SO2 and one particle of O2 will form. So when one particle of SO3 will dissociate, one particle of SO2 and half particle of O2 will form. So N value is equal to three by two. This is important. Don't put here that it is three. It will be wrong then. N is three by two. Two. So let us practice with the help of an example. There is a question. If SO3 is dissociating at a fixed temperature to follow the following reaction, then at equilibrium, it was found that average molar mass of equilibrium mixture was found to be 72 gram per mole. Find the degree of dissociation of SO3. So if I have to solve this problem, I can directly use this formula. Degree of dissociation is equal to M theoretical minus M experimental upon M experimental N minus one. For this reaction, we have discussed that by dissociation of two particles, three particles are forming by dissociation of one particle, three by two. So N is three by two. So if we put value over here, theoretical molar mass of SO3 is 80. Experimental, they have given 72 upon 72. 3 by 2 minus 1 is half. So if I simplify this, that is equal to 8 divided by 36. 8 divided by 36. We can further simplify. This is equal to divisible by 4 on both sides. So 2 and this will be 9. So 2 by 9 is degree of dissociation. Now we can further simplify. So you can directly use the formula. Be careful about n. And I was going through the questions and I found that they have asked many questions regarding simultaneous equilibrium. So let us discuss the concept of simultaneous equilibrium. In a chemical reaction, if two or more than two chemical reactions taking place simultaneously, then we'll say that simultaneous equilibrium will be established. So while solving the questions of simultaneous equilibrium, some chemical species common in both reactions. So be careful while we're writing the total pressure. So how to proceed for that? We are taking one example. So let me read this example. If initially partial pressure of NO is 2.85, partial pressure of NO2 is 5.7, and then find partial pressure of N2O3 if total pressure at equilibrium is 5.05. .05. So they are asking, Final pressure of N2O5 means pressure of N2O5 at equilibrium. At equilibrium, pressure of N2O4 is given that is 1.7 atm. The reaction taking place simultaneously in a container is given below. These are the reactions given below. So whenever we have to proceed, we should write that initially what is there. So initially at time t is equal to zero, we can write that the pressure of NO2 in the system so NO2 is participating in the first reaction. So NO2 pressure is 5.7. Wherever NO2 is there, it is present in the system. So NO2 is here also. We should write that at time t is equal to zero, the pressure of NO2 is 5.7. Wherever NO2 is there, we write the same pressure because this is pressure of NO2 in the container. Now, the pressure of NO is given, in, it is in the second reaction, 2.85. So now this is the initial pressure. There is no N2O3, there is no N2O4. Now we have to write that what is the pressure at equilibrium. 
So pressure at equilibrium, this reaction will move in forward direction. So we'll write 5.7 minus 2x. And when we are writing all these things, it is a common sense when we are writing with respect to pressure means volume and temperature is constant. Now here, if 5.7 minus 2x, then this value will be x. This is x. And here we can write that at equilibrium. This is 5.7 minus 2x. This is because of the first reaction. Now, because of the second reaction, when the second reaction will move in forward direction, we can write 2.85 minus y. So here we have to write because coefficient is equal for these two. So we'll write y here. So here also we have to write the same pressure of NO2 in first and second reaction. This is y, right? So this is the pressure of all these four gases. I think there are four gases only, no? NO2, N2O4, NO, and N2O3. Four gases are there in the system. So if we write that, what is the total pressure at equilibrium? The total pressure at equilibrium means partial pressure of NO2 at equilibrium, partial pressure of N2O4 at equilibrium, partial pressure of NO gas at equilibrium, and partial pressure of N2O3 gas at equilibrium. So we cannot blindly write all the reactant and product because NO2 is common. Be careful about that. So now if I put the value, before putting the value, they have given that the pressure of N2O3 in the system we have to calculate, but pressure of N2O4 at equilibrium is 1.7. So value of X is known, that is 1.7. We have to calculate the pressure of N2O3 that is equal to Y. So now I am writing total pressure in the system at equilibrium is 5.05, 5.05. The pressure of NO2 at equilibrium is equal to 5.7 minus two times of X. We'll put the value of X later on minus Y. This is partial pressure of NO2. Partial pressure of N2O4 is X. Partial pressure of NO gas is 2.85 minus Y. And partial pressure of N2O3 is Y. So if I simplify Y and Y will cancel out here, we know the value of X. So from there we'll calculate the value of Y. Once we know the value of Y, we know what is the partial pressure of N2O3 at equilibrium. So in this question, I just want to say that if a chemical species is present in more than one reaction, its, its pressure or its number of moles or its concentration will same in both the reaction because this is present in the same container. So everywhere its concentration or pressure or number of moles will be same, right? So this is a question which is a typical question you have not, if you have not solved it earlier, you are not able to solve this question. This was asked in mains, right? So very easy question, but it is a typical question. So what is a question? We'll go through that. Two compounds A and B dissociate into gaseous product at 20 degrees Celsius. At 20 degrees Celsius, pressure over excess of solid A is 50 mm. So only A solid is there. Excess of solid A means this equilibrium will be there. And if the equilibrium is starting from this solid, the pressure of this gas A dash and the pressure of H2S will be equal. And that is equal to 50 mm. So pressure of one gas will be 25 mm. So Kp for this reaction is pressure of A dash into pressure of H2S, which is 25 into 25 on simplification. We got the value of 625. So from the first line, pressure over excess of solid A is 50. From there, we calculate the Kp of this reaction, first reaction. Same way, pressure over excess of solid B is 68 mm. Same way, we can say that this solid is there in excess and it is dissociating. So pressure of gas B dash and H2S will be equal and only these are present in the system. So if its pressure is P, its pressure is P. So 2PT is equal to 68. So P is equal to 32. So the Kp value for the second reaction, Kp2 is 32 square. That is 1156 millimeter square. So with the given information, we have calculated the value of Kp1 and Kp2 and Kp only depends on temperature. So now they are saying that find the total pressure of gas over the solid mixture, total pressure of gas over the solid mixture of A and B in mm of mercury, nothing is mentioned about temperature, means they are talking about the same temperature. So this is now simultaneous equilibrium. Now A and B present in the same container. So at equilibrium, we'll write that some amount of solid A is there, 
some amount of solid B is there. So on dissociation of A, if the pressure of A dax gas is equal to X, then H2S will be X. Pressure of B dash gas will be Y, then this will be Y. Since H2S is common, so it is X plus Y and it is X plus Y. This will be the pressure of all the chemical species, gaseous chemical species at equilibrium. So if I write that, what is the P total at equilibrium? P total at equilibrium is equal to pressure of A dash gas, pressure of B dash gas plus pressure of H2S. There are three gases at equilibrium. Pressure of A dash gas is X, B dash gas is Y and pressure of H2S is X plus Y. So P total at equilibrium is two times of X plus Y. When I'm writing what is Kp1, Kp1 for this reaction, and Kp2 for this reaction, we have already calculated that value is equal to 625 upon 1156. So Kp1 is equal to partial pressure of A dash gas that is X up into pressure of H2S that is X plus Y. Kp2 is equal to pressure of B dash gas into pressure of H2S that is X plus Y. So this is going to cancel out. So from there, we'll get the ratio X upon y we get the value of x upon y right and now we have to calculate what is the value of x plus y so i can write like this i can write that kp1 is equal to x into x plus y kp2 is equal to y x plus y if i add the first and second then i can write that kp1 plus kp2 is equal to x plus y whole square so X plus Y is under root of KP1 plus KP2. On putting the value of KP1 and KP2, I can write that X plus Y is equal to under root of KP1 is 1744. Sorry, KP1 is 625 and KP2 is 1156. On adding both, we are getting that this value is equal to 1781. And now if suppose this type of calculation is coming in mains and uh, advance, how to proceed it? So if I have to solve this under root up to two decimal place, what is the method I will follow? Like if we go by hit and trial method, 42 square will be 1144, 1744 and 43 square is 1849. We have to use it and trial method to find out this value. So I know that this 1781 is more nearer to 141744. So I can write that this is equal to 1744 plus 37 to the power half that is x plus y and now we can use that expansion term i can simplify this we can write that this value is equal to if i take 1744 outside means 42 square ka under root will be 42 so this is 42 and this is 1 plus 37 divided by 1744 and 37 upon 1744 is very small with respect to 1. So we can use that expansion. We can write that this value is equal to this power is half. So we can write that this value is equal to 42 1 plus half times of 37 into 1744. And then we can further simplify. By doing that, we are able to simplify the answer up to two decimal place. So if it is coming, calculation is coming, it, its chances is more in advance. If it is coming in mains also, we should proceed like this under root of some numbers, right? Now we are discussing about the most important point in chemical equilibrium that is Lee Chatelier principle. So first question is Lee Chatelier principle is valid for what? It is valid for physical equilibrium as well as chemical equilibrium. And it, is, it states that a change in any of the factors that determines the equilibrium condition of a system will cause the system to change in such a manner as, so as the so as to reduce or to counteract the effect of the change so as to reduce or counteract so we have to understand that what is the meaning of counteract what is the meaning of reduce like I'm taking example that which factors can uh, can affect equilibrium state. So equilibrium state, when we are discussing, we are assuming that temperature is constant. If you change the temperature, equilibrium constant will change. Definitely equilibrium state will also change. But keeping temperature same, 
we are discussing what are the factors which can affect equilibrium state. So the first change is external change. External change means volume change. I am increasing volume or decreasing volume. So external change is related with volume. Addition of inert gas, there are two possibilities. I can add the gas at constant volume or I can add the gas at constant pressure. Addition of inert gas at constant pressure is important for us. Addition or removal of reactant and product. When we are adding or removing something, it will not mention in the question, but it is a common sense that when we are adding and removing reactant and product, the volume of the system and temperature of the system is constant. Volume and temperature is constant, right? So it's a common sense under constant volume and temperature, we are adding and subtracting, and then we are finding that what is going to happen in which direction the reaction will go. So on leach at layer principle, we are going to solve the first example. This is the most common example, best example of leach at layer principle. Let me read this question. Many of you have done this. Let us revise the concept through this example. Solid ammonium carbamide dissociate according to the following reaction. At equilibrium, ammonia is added such that partial pressure of ammonia at new equilibrium state is equal to original total pressure. Calculate the ratio of total pressure at new equilibrium state with respect to old equilibrium state. So already this system is in equilibrium state and we are starting with ammonium carbamide. This solid is there. So it is understood that this equilibrium will establish then this solid will decrease its amount. And according to balance reaction, when this reaction is taking place, we are discussing in terms of pressure when volume temperature is assumed to be constant. So pressure here will be 2p then pressure of this CO2 will be P because moles is directly proportional to pressure when volume and temperature is constant. So from here, I can write that Kp for this reaction is equal to partial pressure of ammonia that is 2P whole square into partial pressure of CO2. So that is equal to 4P cube. This is the equilibrium constant Kp and this is the total pressure at old equilibrium state that is pre partial pressure of ammonia plus partial pressure of CO2 that is equal to 3p. Now they are saying that this is old equilibrium state. We are now disturbing this equilibrium state by adding some amount of ammonia. So now before this equilibrium, we are saying we are doing some change. So now at that time, time is equal to zero. Just we are putting that for the change at that time, the time is equal to zero. And then we are again finding that what will happen at equilibrium state, right? So this solid at time T is equal to zero will remain same. There is no change in this solid. And now we are adding some ammonia, right? So initial pressure was P. Now by adding some ammonia, nothing is mentioned means we are keeping volume temperature constant. So on adding ammonia, the pressure of ammonia is going to increase. And at that point of time, there is no change in pressure of CO2. So you can see that if we add product, right, this reaction will move in backward direction according to leach at layer principle. So when it is moving in backward direction, a new equilibrium state will establish. So the number of moles of ammonium carbamide a little bit more than the initial equilibrium state. And here we can write that this pressure is equal to 2P plus A minus 2X. And this will be P minus X. So this is the new partial pressure of ammonia at equilibrium. And this is the new partial pressure of CO2 at equilibrium. When we are keeping the temperature same on adding reactant and product, the value of Kp is not going to change. So Kp is 4P cube only. And they are saying that this new pressure of ammonia is equal to old equilibrium pressure, old total equilibrium pressure, which is 3P. So this whole value is equal to 3P. So Kp is not going to change. So I can write that 4PQ is equal to partial pressure of ammonia whole square means 3P whole square into partial pressure of CO2 at new equilibrium state, new equilibrium state. So from here, we can calculate that partial pressure of CO2 at new equilibrium state is equal to 4 by 9P. If you simplify, this is 9p square, p square and p square will cancel out 4 by 9p. So now if I calculate that, what is the total pressure at new equilibrium state? That is partial pressure of CO2 at new equilibrium state is 3p and partial pressure of CO2. Ammonia is 3p and CO2 is equal to 4 by 9 times of p. If I simplify this, 27 plus 4 is 
31. 31 by 9 times of P. And they are asking that find out the ratio of total pressure at new equilibrium state at with respect to old equilibrium state. So when we are calculating the answer, total pressure at new equilibrium state is 31 by 9 times of P. And initially it was 3 times of P. So this P will cancel out. We can write that this is 31 by 27. So very good question, right? Very common. So with this, we have find out how to proceed about lee chatelier principle. The value of equilibrium constant only depends on temperature. If you are not changing the temperature, equilibrium constant is not going to change. Now, taking another example by which maximum theory will cover, keeping that in mind, I have taken this heterogeneous equilibrium in which Na, NO3 in solid state on heating will form because we have to dissociate this ionic solid. So it is an endothermic reaction. So on heating, it will form NaNO3 solid and O2 solid. So the first few parts here, they are predict the direction of the following changes. What will be the direction? Reaction will move in forward or backward. We are discussing. So on increasing temperature, we know that reaction is endothermic. So since it is endothermic on increasing temperature, reaction will move in forward direction. The second point is, this is important on adding NaNO3 solid, what will happen? So when we write what is equilibrium constant Kc for this reaction, that is equal to number of moles of O2 upon volume of the container. There is no term of number of moles of NaNO3 or NaNO2 in this equilibrium state. So on adding or removing any of the solid, there is no effect on equilibrium state. So that's why there is no effect on equilibrium state, no effect. This is very common in exam, no effect on equilibrium state because equilibrium state is not going to disturb because equilibrium state depends on moles of O2 and volume of the container, nothing is changing. So it is not going to disturb. Same way we can say for the third example, this is also important that on adding and removing any amount of solid still, small amount of this solid will remain here, a small amount of this solid will remain here. So there is no effect on equilibrium state. Fourth point, on increasing the volume, we have written Kc here and volume is in denominator. So if I increase the volume, the reaction quotient Qc is less than because volume is in denominator. So we can say that Qc is less than Kc. If Qc is less than Kc, reaction will move in forward direction. So on increasing volume, the reaction will move in forward direction. Now for the same thing, they can compare that what is the partial pressure of oxygen at old equilibrium state, old equilibrium state. So partial pressure of oxygen at e old equilibrium state is Kp for this reaction, whatever Kp of the, this reaction, this reaction is taking place at constant temperature, so Kp will be same. Now what will happen that when we increase the volume, on increasing the volume, the reaction will move in forward direction. Due to in moving the reaction in forward direction, moles of O2 will increase, but volume is also increasing. So partial pressure of O2 is not going to change. So here we can say that partial pressure of O2 at old and new equilibrium state will be same. So this is counteract. Whatever the change in pressure we have done, the system is again moving in such a way that that whatever effect is that, that is counteract. So here there is no change in pressure. Of course, there is change in moles. There is change in volume, but there is no change in pressure at new and old equilibrium state. On adding O2, again here common sense is there. When they are saying we are adding O2, common sense is there that volume and temperature is constant. Then we are discussing all these things. So when volume and temperature is constant, if you increase the number of moles, then we can say here that Q is greater than Kc. If Q is greater than Kc, this reaction will move in backward direction. We know that when product is there, on adding the product at constant volume and temperature, the reaction will move in forward, backward direction, provided that chemical species should come in the expression of equilibrium. Here, NaNO3, if you add at constant volume, there is no change on equilibrium state. Next point. Sixth point, on adding inert gas at constant volume, we know that in this system, suppose this is the system at equilibrium, so there is number of moles of O2, there is some volume and temperature, 
right and these solids these two solids are there in this system and they are saying that now we are adding an inert gas and keeping the volume same we know that partial pressure of a gas if i'm discussing about partial pressure of ot it depends on number of moles of o2 rt upon volume neither we are changing volume nor we are changing temperature nor we are changing moles so partial pressure will remain same so we'll say that addition of O2 at constant volume, there is no effect on equilibrium state. No effect on equilibrium state. But the same question is there. Addition of addition of O2 at constant pressure. This is important. Let us discuss what will happen when we add inert gas. So same system is there, right? Let me draw here this system that these two solids will be there and there is number of moles of O2. Now what we are doing, we are adding an inert gas, but we want to keep the pressure same. So if we keep the volume same, then total pressure will increase. I have to keep the pressure constant, then I have to increase the volume. So when we are adding an inert gas X, we have to increase the volume. Once we are increasing the volume, we can check here. This is expression for equilibrium constant. We are increasing volume. So we can say here that QC is less than KC means reaction will move in forward direction. When the reaction will move in forward direction, then the number of moles of oxygen gas will increase. So if, if again, if I am saying that I have added inert gas and increased volume by delta V1 amount, and then again, if I don't change the volume, then again, pressure will change because reaction is moving in forward direction. So in order to counteract that I have to increase the volume one more time. So two times there is volume increase. One is because of addition of inert gas. And the second time, since the moles of gas are increasing, we have to keep the pressure same. That's why we have to again increase the volume. So now again, we, we can write that the pressure of O2 gas at the old equilibrium state is now equal to the pressure of inert gas plus pressure of O2. This is the situation, right? And for equilibrium state, pressure of O2 at the new equilibrium state should be equal to old and that is not possible. Pressure of O2 is always less than the pressure of O2 at old. So what will happen that this reaction will complete in forward direction. There is no equilibrium established. This reaction is complete in forward direction. Because always when there is inert gas and we are keeping the pressure constant, always the pressure of O2 old because Kp is O2 old, pressure of O2 old. So if Kp is constant, pressure of O2 old is constant and pressure of new O2 is always less than pressure of old O2. That's why if pressure of new O2 is less, then the reaction will move in forward direction till all Na and O3 is completely dissociated. So this is very important part, addition of inert gas at constant pressure in case of heterogeneous equilibrium. This example is given in NCRT and there are chances that there are chances that they will ask in mains. Already these questions are there in advance, right? So this is very important. This reaction is given. Iron plus three test is there. The iron plus three in aqueous medium is yellow in color. So if we add SCN minus ion, thiocyanate ion. It is colorless ion, but it will combine to form blood red coloration. So it is a test for iron plus three ion basic radical. So deep red color of FeSCN2 plus will form. Now <clears throat> they're asking that for this system is in equilibrium. If we are adding potassium thiocyanate, what will happen, right? So it's a common sense when we are adding, we are adding, increasing the number of moles of this, keeping the volume constant. So what is happening that, or we can say if uh, this is a large system and we have added a small, so volume change will be small, but the number of moles of SCN minus will increase, right? So when we increase this, the system will try to decrease its concentration. So this reaction will move in forward direction. When this reaction will move in forward direction, the intensity of yellow color will decrease. The intensity of deep red color will increase. So here we'll say that, intensity of red color intensity of red color will increase will increase so this is easy to predict because kcn is there now this is important hgcl2 hg2 plus ion is there 
So what will happen when we add this Hg2 plus ion in form of HgCl2? This Hg2 plus ion will react with SCN minus ion to form a very stable complex Hg SCN four times two minus. And because of consumption of SCN, SCN is going to decrease. So system will try to move in backward direction to compensate it. If it is moving in backward direction, we can say that intensity of red color will decrease. Intensity of red color will decrease. And the third part, oxalic acid. Again, it is related to iron plus three iron. Iron plus three iron will combine with oxalate iron to form a very stable complex. We'll study a in coordination compound. This is very stable complex. Fe C2O4 whole thrice. So three minus three minus. So this is that this complex is very stable because Fe plus three ion is consumed. This reaction will move in backward direction. If this reaction will move in backward direction, we can say that intensity of red color will decrease. Very common if you have this these two information, you can predict since it is given in NCRT. So it is supposed that you should know this information. So very important for mains as well as advance. And this is also in lab manual. You are supposed to do experiment on in lab. Lab manual mein ye de rakha hai. Aapko experiment karna hai is equation pe. So cobalt in aqueous medium is in pink in color. Cobalt plus three in aqueous medium is pink in color. And it is existing in octahedral complex. So when we are adding Cl minus, it is converted into this and this ligand is displaced by Cl minus. So this complex is blue in color. Now, the first thing when you do experiment, you should know about this reaction is this reaction is endothermic or exothermic. So you should know from experiment that this is an endothermic reaction. This is an endothermic reaction. The second question is at room temperature, what is the color of the equilibrium mixture? So when you are doing experiment, when you put these conditions, right, depending upon the concentration of the reactant and product, the color will depend. So at room temperature, this reaction is blue in color means there is a large amount of this chloride complex, right? So we can say that from doing experiment, we should know that at room temperature, this reaction is moving more in forward direction. So blue color will dominate. So what we'll do in this experiment at room temperature, it is blue in color. We put this solution in an ice pick near, near the solution. We put ice. We are decreasing the temperature of the solution. So when we are decreasing the temperature, suppose the temperature is near about zero degree Celsius at zero degree Celsius. What is the color of equilibrium mixture? Since it is an endothermic process, if you decrease the temperature reaction will move in backward direction. So you should know that on decreasing the temperature, the color of this solution be becomes pink. And the last question is, what is the effect of dilution on equilibrium state? So for this reaction, if I write KC, this is very important point, right? You write this reaction in this form. Kc for this reaction is equal to number of moles of blue complex. Coefficient of this blue complex is 1. So number of moles upon volume of the solution. So this is concentration. We'll not write this because this is solvent divided by, divided by, again here coefficient is 1. So we can write that the number of moles of pink color complex ion divided by volume of the solution. And here, Number of moles of Cl minus ion divided by V to the power 4. So if you simplify this V and V will cancel out. But V to the power 4 is there in numerator. So if I write what is Kc. Kc is equal to number of moles of blue ion complex upon number of moles of pink ion complex. Number of moles of Cl minus to the power 4. Volume to the power 4 is coming in numerator. Now, if you are diluting, you are increasing on dilution, volume will increase on dilution, volume will increase. If volume will increase, we can say that QC is greater than KC. If QC is greater than KC, we can say that reaction will move in backward direction. So some people without thinking about the volume of the system, they will say that water will not come in equilibrium state. So equilibrium will not disturb. This is wrong. This is a trap. 
when you are writing concentration, the volume of system is coming. So first by writing that, you will find out that volume of the system is coming in numerator and denominator, and then you have to answer. You do not go through this, that this is not coming in equilibrium state, but volume of the system is coming in equilibrium state, right? So very important point. And this is the last point. This is an example. Let's go through the example. These type of graphs are mentioned in NCRT. So based on these type of graphs, it is very common that J means will or J advance will ask question. These type of graphs are mentioned in NCRT, right? So let us go through the reaction. This is the reaction given four times of A in gaseous state, B2 in gaseous state will form two times of A to B in gaseous state. If I write what is Kc for the reaction in terms of number of moles and volume, if I simplify, I will get this because number of moles of A to B square upon volume square, number of moles of A upon volume to the power four, number of moles of B2 upon volume, if you simplify, there are five volume in denominator, there are two volume in uh, here, in the denominator of the numerator, right? If you simplify, finally you will get three volume, volume to the power three in the numerator. So this is value of Kc, right? And in the question, they have mentioned that this reaction is endothermic. Reaction is endothermic, right? Now we have to match it. Like in the first option, we have to find out that this was initial state of the system. So initially the system, there are two chemical species mentioned here, right? So we can say that this is at time t is equal to zero and this is about because initially there is no product and these re these are reactants so they are related to this these two reactants and if nothing is mentioned will take according to balance reaction so concentration of a should be more than b so this is regarding a and this is regarding b2 and this is initially zero so this is product so this is regarding a to b so now initially there is a and B in a stoichiometric ratio, now they will react. So their concentration is going to decrease and this is equilibrium state. So equilibrium state is there now. Now at this time, we have done some change. We have disturbed the equilibrium state. Now, if you see the graph here, the concentration of these two reactant is suddenly decreased and the concentration of product is also suddenly decreased. How it is possible that all the reactant and product concentration is decreasing? That will be possible when we increase the volume suddenly. So we can increase the volume suddenly by addition of inert gas or by volume change, right? So if we see here, addition of inert gas at constant pressure, this is possible because when you add, because when this reaction is there, volume is in numerator, right? So when these three chemical species are there at equilibrium A, B2 and A to B and you are adding an inert gas at constant pressure, you have to increase the volume. If you increase the volume, their concentration is suddenly going to decrease. And because of that, since volume here is in numerator, so we can say that QC is greater than KC. If QC is greater than KC, reaction will move in backward direction. The action is moving in backward direction means further concentration of product is going to decrease. So here there is further sudden decrease in concentration of product and then there is sudden increase in concentration of reactant and then equilibrium state will establish. So this is related to addition of inert gas at constant pressure or this is related to increase in volume increase in volume. So A answer will be S and T. Now going through the second graph, in the second graph again this is concentration of A, B2 and A to B and equilibrium state is there. At this equilibrium state there is no sudden change in concentration of reactant but the there is a sudden increase in concentration of product that is possible when we add A to B at constant volume. So addition of A to B at equilibrium, if we add A to B at equilibrium, this graph is supporting, there is no change, right? And when we are adding volume and temperature is constant, right? And because of addition of product, we know that the reaction will move in backward direction. When the reaction will move in backward direction, the concentration of reactants will increase. So the concentration of both the reactants are increasing. So we can say that for B graph, R is the matching, right? So for B graph, R will be the matching. For C graph, again here equilibrium state is there and now you can see that there is sudden increase in concentration of all the reactant and product. That is possible when 
we are decreasing the volume. When we decrease the volume, there is sudden increase in uh, concentration of all the reactant and product. Decrease in volume means increase in pressure. So that's why we can match that. For this, there is increase in pressure or decrease in volume. If we write decrease in volume, here we can say QC is less than KC, then the reaction will move in forward direction. So there is sudden increase and then reaction is moving in forward. So due to increase in forward, the concentration of A to B is increasing, but the concentration of the two reactants are decreasing. So finally, it is matching with Q option. And now we are discussing the D option. There is equilibrium state and there is no sudden change in concentration of any reactant and product. And this reaction is endothermic. We know that. In endothermic reaction, if we increase the temperature, reaction will move in forward direction. So here, there is no sudden change, but reaction is moving in forward direction because concentration of A to B is increasing, but the concentration of reactant is decreasing. So that is possible when we are increasing the temperature of the reaction. So because of that, we can say that P is the matching for D graph. P is the matching for D graph. So keeping in mind what they have asked in J means, and always remember that in J means, because it is one topic only, and from one topic, it is not possible to ask more questions, right? So they have limitations. So there is a trap for them that when they are discovering that which is the best possible question they will ask from chemical equilibrium, then they will think that, solubility and solubility product that's why every each and every paper you will find that most of the question in equilibrium is coming from solubility and solubility product very few questions from chemical equilibrium so i have tried my best to cover all those points which are important according to je means so again i am saying that aapko hamara video pasand aaya hai तो प्लीज इसको लाइक करें और इस बात का ध्यान रखें कि ये सारी तैयारी मेंस के हिसाब से हो रही है तो अगर आप मेरी बातों को फॉलो करेंगे जहां पे जो चीजें याद रखनी है जैसे लिक्विड सॉल्यूशन में जो सेकंड पार्ट था उसमें बहुत सारे सॉल्यूशंस पॉजिटिव और डेविएशन नेगेटिव डेविएशन के एग्जाम्पल्स आपको याद रखने हैं तो जो चीजें याद रखने वाली है वो जेई में भी पूछ जेई एडवांस में भी पूछी गई है देर आर मल्टीपल क्वेश्चन बेस्ड ऑन विच इज नेगेटिव डेविएशन एंड विच इज पॉजिटिव डेविएशन सो प्लीज फॉलो वॉट आई एम सेंग इट इज फॉर योर बेनिफिट राइट सो कीप वॉचिंग एंड प्लीज डोंट फर्गेट टू लाइक अवर वीडियो थैंक यू